Hey, so, hi, welcome. I'm so excited, we can keep talking. We will keep talking, we're gonna make you keep talking. Um, I'm trying to find my notes. So my three flights this morning were delayed, were oh. like canceled and delayed oh, and canceled. Delay. So I'm a little out of sorts because I literally walked in the building. So I apologize. <laughs> I'm, I'm Larissa Fast Horse. Um, thank you. Yay. <laughs> Larissa Fast Horse and uh, this is Kita Sullivan. And we are um, co-facilitating this. And I'm supposed to do the first thing, which is why I'm trying to find our notes. Got it. <laughs> All right. So hi, welcome um, to Instead of Red Face, um, a very ally welcome room, as well as uh, quite a few indigenous folks in the room. It grows every year. We're so excited. Um, the first time I did this, there was like, I don't know, three of them? <laughs> the first time I came, there's like three, four of us indigenous folks in the room. There's quite a few today, um, which is great. Um, so one thing we just want to talk about real quick is um, protocols. So in indigenous spaces, one, we tend to sit in circles. We like to see each other, and we like to all be part of one um, collective group. So that's hence why we're in a circle, <coughs> not just because it's nice, but it's actually intentional. Um, another thing that's really important that we just like to discuss um, is elders. Um, and, and this is not, now this, this is making pan-Indian general, generalizations, which I will tell you later never to do, but <laughs> I'm gonna do one. I get to, I got a card. Um, <laughs> I got the biggest like, Wonder Woman turquoise bracelet. So, um, uh, so one of the things that is fairly common is our respect for elders and for um, the space they have earned and the honor it is for us to get to listen to them. Um, so it's not just like, oh, they get to talk because they're old, it's that we get to have the honor of listening to what they have to share. And that's a fantastic thing. So um, we try to honor that here. If elders have to speak, you're always, it's your floor first, always. Um, the other thing we often then do, there's two things. So the indigenous way of listening is really lovely um, because what it does is it frees you. Now it's gonna be hard for some folks, I understand. But if you just listen when someone is speaking, don't think about what's coming next. Don't think about what you wanna say. Just listen and then we will all take a breath in between and have a moment of silence for reflection. Um, that is a common um, indigenous way of, of, of listening so that you get to listen fully and not have to worry about yourself, but just worry about the person who you're giving the attention to. So when someone speaks, finishes speaking, ready, we're gonna practice now. Yeah, that didn't hurt. We all take a breath. And we just have a moment of silence to like consider what we want to say, to allow our elders to not have to fight for space if they want it, and then the next person speaks. So we would ask you to respect that protocol um, as well. Um, I will now turn it over to Kita, who will probably come up with all the things I forgot. I'm starting something we're going to do sooner, but we didn't have our paper yet. Um, I'm starting a sample list of things to celebrate. This is in no way a full list, and we'll discuss it. This is for you guys to add to. So I'm just throwing out some things that um, I know about. And there we go. Um, so uh, before we go on, I'd like to, as Ty said, this when we started, um, to thank the original inhabitants, the original caretakers of this land, and particularly uh, the Conway, uh, Conway Piscata uh, Nation, uh, who I actually reached out to um, to explain why we were here and get their blessings on us being in this, on this land. So I would like to say thank you to them and to uh, the Creator for allowing us to be in this space. Um, and one of the things that I want to say about that is that I am on target. I am from New York. Uh, I don't know the people in this land, but the way to find the answer to that, and this, this is really important for those who have said, oh, I can't find an indigenous actor, is to ask. Mm -hmm. um, I reached out first to a friend at the uh, Baltimore Indian Center, who, that, who of course would know who's here. And she put me in contact with the people here. So um, that's the first thing I'd like to say is that we don't know everything. Uh, there are at least five different nations in this room. And we don't know each other's traditions. We don't know each other's language. But the way to get around that is to ask. If you don't ask, you don't learn. And if you don't ask, you can't change. So that's part of what I would like. That's what, part of what I would like to 
So we're going to do a round of introductions, and we're going to ask that you keep it short. However, we have three things that we really do want to know from each of you. Your name and where you're from, why you're here, and what is your definition of red face? Okay, so those are three things. And we do want to keep it quickly, um, because there are a lot of us in this room, probably more than we thought. Um, but um, I do, uh, we're very interested in learning what is your definition of red face as well as why you're here. Um, so I will start. Good afternoon, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Ryan Conero. Um, I come from my parents, Pat and Jeannie Conero, who are originally from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I have lived um, for about 14 years based in Nome and Juneau, Alaska, and now I'm in New York City with Ping Chong and Company, and still maintaining residence in Juneau as well. Um, and Ping Chong and Company, uh, we are working on a piece um, sharing the stories set in Alaska, including some Alaska Native stories, Alaska Native histories, um, which is part of my interest in being here today. Um, my definition of red face, I'm continuing to learn, and uh, I would define it right now as um, including uh, embodying representation of, of uh, indigenous people by non-indigenous people, but also representing stories of indigenous people and perspectives of indigenous people um, without the participation of those people throughout the process. Um, my name is Heather Henson. Um, I currently am living in New York, but my ancestry comes from uh, Scandinavia and uh, England and Ireland journey. And, uh, but been here about five generations. Um, um, I'm here in this room because I think um, a theater um, gathering uh, under uh, indigenous um, centric thinking um, is a necessary component for um, that mission uh, for this world. So kind of, I think it's really important that we get the, the <coughs> yeah. I don't want to get into the, okay. So, and then a red face I think is also is about um, um, non-informed, like what you were just saying, we're going to hear the same answer probably in time. But um, non-native um, representation from a non-informed place. Can you take that out? Great. Thanks. Um, Randy Reinholz, I'm the Artistic Director of Native Voices at the Autry. I'm an enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. I'm here because I love this conversation and I like the leaders of our conversation. Thank you for taking on that task. And. Uh, Red faces, for me, it's a it's a propagation of hurtful war images, and it's uh, in a country that forgets that our people have been at war for hundreds of years, and uh, using those images drag up all that history, uh, and people do it in a very coarse, deliberate, hurtful way. I'm Claudia Fisher. I grew up in Colorado, New Mexico, and um, and <coughs> now based in Portland, Oregon, and. Um, Usually, my first definition of red face is um, yeah, a non-native person playing a native character on stage. Um, I'm Elizabeth Heffern. I'm a playwright. I live in Seattle. Hey, and uh, I, you know, I, I'm here partly because I, I've, I've been doing quite a bit of work on uh, environmental plays, uh, nuclear issues as a lot as current one, and the thing I come up to all the time as I'm actually doing the research is it's the tribes that are protecting everybody in the country. I mean, without the 1855 Western treaties, uh, basically there's no say in stuff. I mean, and I feel like the culture is is a non-profit mode of one, and I, I'm just... Um, here for that. Uh, I, I think red face, I agree with everybody. So far, I mean, it's like putting a non-native person into some kind of role, but also <coughs> using those stories um, it, without permission or without, because the stories have a life and they shouldn't, I mean, doing that as well. 
Um, my name is Stan Foote. I'm from Portland, Oregon, the artistic director of Oregon Children's Theater. I'm here specifically because 10 years ago I had the opportunity to direct six natives on stage in a show of 13 people, so the majority of the cast was Native American. And um, it was a huge learning experience, a huge growth experience, and I still have fills my soul with stuff. Um, never heard red face until I saw this, but um, I want that experience again, so I'm in search of another project that does that. I'm Adolfa Pollock and I'm from Connecticut, um, via also New York and Pittsburgh and Ohio. <laughs> and I am I'm here uh, because I'm just really interested in this discussion and what what everyone is ha has to say and what is the part of it, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and I'm also uh, collaborating with um, with some some people who who are indigenous and and I want to I want to know more um, just about about every, about everyone that I'm working with and then also a greater community um, at large. And red face just sounds like a a racist cultural construction to me. So <laughs> I don't know what else there is to, oh, to it, so I'm here to learn. Um, Buju Seguli, um, Thai, uh, Indigenous Kaz, Gijik Indigenous Kaz, Nish Manitowoc. Um, I am here because I'm really excited. I also love the facilitators in this room because they are Indigenous women who are leading this conversation. Um, you know, so there's that's like a nuance. I'm interested in in protocols and how that can take a national effect in theaters, so that these things can just be woven throughout because we are from many different nations. Um, I think red face is something that's um, you know appropriating uh, uh, indigenous native identity that's both intentional and both unintentional and political. I think all of these things. So it's a very complicated thing to talk about both on and off stages both within design concepts that we see on national television, in theater, day-to-day uh, -day microaggressions in the offices, um, the way you handle and deal things when you do introductions maybe for your theater seasons. I mean, all these kinds of things have a hinge and sprinkle of red face in them because we here are in the United States or operating under this you know, scope of a, a national identity. So hopefully folks, this con conversation can continue into the sovereignty conversation on Saturday, which will provide a, a more in-depth <coughs> context to also why we're talking about red face. So. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pam Joyce. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I'm here today because uh, uh, there was this play, Assimilation, written by Native American Jack Dalton. And, uh, and we, at, at, the, at our, at the university where I work, um, we had agreed to do the play, because um, I suggested it, and then, and then I got some really strong resistance, and ultimately we did not do the play, and there's just something unresolved about that. I didn't expect to, ha uh, to encounter that resistance, so. Um, and then in terms of red face, I agree with everything that's been said. I think the only thing I would add to it is the first thing that pops into my mind is that just really stereotypical kind of uh, physical embodiment of, of uh, the, you know, what, what kids play when they would do something like Cowboys and Indians in the 50s or something. So. Hi, I'm Marcia Douglas, and I teach at the University of Maine. I live in Bangor, Maine. Um, I've done a number of plays with some Native people in our community and have an ongoing interest in that. Um, in our neighborhood, it's almost as if the Native people are invisible, which always puzzles me. So the idea of red face is doubly strange. Um, and as soon as I hear, hear the term, all I can think of is lies, false face. That's what I think of. Hi everyone, my name is Kala. I'm from Maine. I haven't been to Bangor before, but I'm more <laughs> from the South. Um, I'm here with Dog and Pony DC. 
and I work as a deaf artist here and I collaborate with other people in the deaf community as well as in the hearing community. I'm really here to support as an ally and to learn about this community. I mean, I really feel like the word red face is a little bit new to me, but what I really understand it to be is when someone is sort of taking on that identity and they aren't someone who is a part of that group and it is a, um, from misinformation and just falsity that is spread. I'm Greg Johnson. I'm the artistic director of the Montana Repertory Theater and the professional theater in residence at the University of Montana. And in Montana, there are seven nations. So it would be it behooves us to uh, have a dialogue, continuing artistic dialogue with with the indigenous population, which we have done. And uh, uh, that's I, I'm here to to listen to the dialogue and to be part of the dialogue because of our interest in the Native American stories. And red face to me is up everything everybody said. I'm an East Coastener, so when I hear red face, I immediately think of black face, and then I wonder what the differences are. <laughs> I'm so wondering. I'm so wondering. I'm taking my breath. <laughs> Um, my name is Lauren Stevens. I'm a Broadway producer, and I grew up in New Jersey, married someone from Milwaukee, lived in Milwaukee, Chicago, and now I'm back in New York. I've been doing Broadway since 07. I've done everything from August Wilson's, as a co-producer, from Radio Golf to Arthur Miller's All My Sons, to Ragtime, the musical, to Rocky the musical, yo, to uh, the upcoming musical that I'm very proud to be a part of called Come From Away, which... Oh, good. Yeah, yeah that's a good I saw, show. I saw it. Can you explain it? It's like, how do you explain that musical? 9-11. Uh, yeah, see, we don't want to start with that. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of planes this landed in Canada. This is a commercial production. And there was 7,000 people and became there a town of 15,000. Yeah, uh, on 9-11, on 38 planes were <coughs> diverted to this teeny weeny little town in, in New Finland called Gander. They literally had less people in the town than the 7,000 that came off the 38 planes from all over the world. And for five days, this community went all out in ways that are humorous, are touching, loving, everything you can imagine. So this is a musical that, you know, for me as a commercial producer, they don't come around very often. We're not going to, I mean, I'd love to be Hamilton, but we're not. <laughs> um, but, you know, that it, it's so meaningful right now with what's going on in our world um, to show that people can have the best of humanity in the worst of times. And it's actually going to be at the Ford's Theater here. It was at La Jolla, Seattle. Ford's in the fall for 9-11 and to show you how corporations like Home Depot are buying out a whole show for the first responders to the Pentagon and all that. It's just really, really cool. So hopefully we'll make it uh, we'll, we'll make it in the commercial world, but we just feel it's a great musical. Um, to get off that plug, uh, prior to this, I um, uh, produced commercials for many years and had a film company. And one of our clients was uh, K-Gun in Tucson, Arizona. We were shooting a spot called Call It Home Tucson. And uh, we wanted to shoot on a Native American reservation. And the Papagos are there in Arizona near Tucson. And uh, the station didn't want us to shoot there. And I don't know what was going on in 1985, but they didn't want us to go. And that's when we were shooting. But somehow I convinced them. and. Please don't be offended that we would shoot in some beautiful tribal dance kind. Of, don't worry about it. You know, we won't show anything that would upset you. And we went to the reservation and, you know, karma and all that. All the children wanted to do break dancing. That's all they wanted to do for us because Michael Jackson was king. And, but the experience of being able to be there and the love. Uh, combined with the heartbreak of seeing how this um, reservation was, was to me life changing. And I feel red face to me, I, I don't relate to it, but I have to tell you there is a restaurant in northern Wisconsin where I was shooting a documentary called The Red Man. 
and they have a teepee that you can eat in. So it, it still exists, and, but to me, um, indigenous, to me, is spirituality and beauty, and um, I, I just feel a natural ability to bring that to the arts, and that's why I'm attracted to it. Um, my name is Hannah Holman. Uh, I'm from the Twin Cities, Minnesota. Um, as you might know, Minnesota has a very uh, deep uh, Native community and many stories. Um, and I think often those stories are erased by the also deep Scandinavian history that happens there, but definitely, definitely not as deep. Um, and so we are, uh, we're a small uh, collaborative theater company and we're interested in telling stories about our community. And as we started digging into some of those histories, we found out that we are not the ones to tell those stories. Um, and that we need to find the people to tell us. So that's kind of why we are um, interested in that. Um, and for me, Red Face is uh, the telling of those stories without having people who are uh, identifying as needed to be in leadership positions and artistic leadership. I'm Laura Leffa McCabe. I'm, I'm also from the Twin Cities. This is our theater company, so those are the same reasons that I'm here. Um, and yeah, I would just echo everything people have said so far about um, Red Face just in terms of um, misappropriation sort of on a really large level, not just um, in terms of performance, but in terms of like everyday life. Good afternoon, my name is Daniel Banks. I'm the outgoing chair of performing arts at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. Um, for me, red face has to do with, as you said, appropriation, violence, and um, traumatization. Tanchi, I bring greetings from the north part of Turtle Island. My name is Cole Elvis. I'm proud of my Métis and Irish heritage from the Turtle Mountains in Manitoba. And I have the privilege of being the leader of the Indigenous Performing Arts Alliance. We're a service organization based in Tacaranto, uh, Toronto. And we claim space for all Indigenous performing artists, which is a huge mandate. And so I've been following Thai and Native Voices of the Autry and Jack Dalton as well uh, from afar. And I feel very privileged to get to be in the circle with you and to see and learn about the experience within what is now called America. <laughs> <laughs> and Red Face for me is any time where, particularly within the performing arts, indigenous stories and um, cultures are being communicated or handled uh, by non-indigenous people. And in Canada, there's a lot of momentum coming out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that is great attention to the residential school legacy, the colonial legacy. And with that comes funding in Canada. And so a concern that I have is how can we be pointing to best practices around shared leadership, um, even within a reconciliatory or a conciliatory project where there's an indigenous and a non-indigenous collaborator, how do we be ensuring that there's agency for those indigenous artists and communities in these stories have been told. I'm Gabe Cohn. I'm the editorial intern for American Theater, uh, and I am a recent graduate of Skidmore College in upstate New York. Uh, I'm here, technically speaking, to represent TCG and to help you guys out if you need anything, uh, but I'm glad that I'm assigned to this particular session. I think it's a very important topic and one that uh, I haven't been involved in many conversations uh, about. That being said, I guess my sense of red face, yeah, has been more a physical representation. Um, and so, yeah, thinking about kind of uh, expanding the boundaries of, 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 of that and also the conversation is particular, uh, particularly interesting to me because I know that like there are situations where people will be doing it uh, with not well, like not with uh, bad intentions necessarily. <coughs> so I think there's uh, hope in that conversation about it in educating people uh, uh, where they can be be better and be smarter and 
make sure those representations happen in the right way and be educated. <coughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Francesca Talenti. I was born in Italy, came here, I was 16, but my mom's Anglo-American, so I'm this Mongol mixture. Uh, I come from the world of cinema. I'm now in the world of theater as a projection designer. But the reason I'm particularly inter interested in this discussion is a number of years ago as I wrote a script about a historical character, the Queen of Pamunkey, but it was mixed in with King Lear and it was not a good script, it was a film script. But she won't let me go and I gotta revisit that story and I'm here to hopefully not engage in red face behavior, writing, whatever. So I need to learn. <clears throat> My name is Fernando Calzadilla and I grew up in Venezuela. And I'm here with Miami Theater Center, so I'm coming from Miami. And um, I'm here to learn. And red face, it's a, for me, it's a racist remnant of colonial period. It's a racist term to describe Native Americans in the United States in particular. And uh, like there are many other similar terms in South America, for example, chola. Uh, I'm here to learn how to get past that. Hi, I'm Stacy Myers. I grew up in Kansas. I work at Kansas City Rep. Um, I'm excited to be here because we produced some of Larissa's work and she's going to be working with us a lot this year, so we're excited for her to be with us uh, and what she has to teach. Um, red face always meant to me racism, just plain and simple. Hi, I'm Marissa Wolf, and um, I currently live in Kansas City. I'm, I'm the director of New Works at Kansas City Rep. And um, uh, I am also here because Laura's Fast Horse is such a badass. And <laughs> I've had the deep, deep pleasure and privilege of collaborating with her over the last few years. And I'm so excited to um, uh, welcome her beautiful play, What Would Crazy Horse Do, to Kansas City Rep for its premiere um, in this, uh, this coming season. And um, uh, yeah, I need, to, I need to just keep being open and learning and, uh, and, and supporting not only Larissa, but of course, um, the advocacy and uh, all of the exciting Native voices um, that we have yet to connect with. Uh, I'm Jeanette Harrison with Alter Theater Ensemble in San Rafael, California. Uh, my blood is Onondaga. My mother's mother's parents were both uh, Onondaga. Uh, my great-grandfather was uh, part of the boarding school system, uh, and he was from Six Nations. My great-grandmother was from Ned Road, New York, just south of Syracuse. And, uh, and then I have a grandpa by marriage who's Uncompadre Ute, Southern Ute. And to me, uh, red face is anything that interrupts the healing that my family is doing from generational trauma and that makes my nieces and nephew ashamed of who they are. Um, I'm Ronnie Pinoy. Um, I'm uh, DC based. I'm the creative producer for both the uh, Wilders Playwrights Collective as well as associate producer for Octopus Theatricals uh, in New York. Um, and uh, I'm, my dad's side of the family is uh, Lubina Pueblo and Cherokee. Um, my mom's side of the family is Polish. Um, and my dad was raised on the Cheyenne Arapaho Reservation. Uh, and, um, and I was raised in Pittsburgh. So uh, one of the things I grew up with, having a very close relationship with my dad, is that distance. Um, from that background, uh, that and, and he also feels that same kind of sense of distance. Um, so when I'm not wearing my producing hat, I'm also a, a musical theater composer, and I've been working on a musical about uh, Carlisle Indian School. Um, my great-grandfather attended Carlisle Indian School and uh, later taught there. Um, so I had a positive experience at the school, so something that I'm now in my uh, seat kind of grappling with. Um, and for me, red face, uh, and I think I feel strongly this way, uh, kind of wearing my uh, background invisibly to many people, um, is for me it's the propagation of uh, white ideas of um, Indian symbolism. So Indian as mystical, as connection to nature, as part of this disappearing West and um, the land, things that are kind of these associations that come from um, this 
fascination from a white point of view as opposed to the actual lived experiences of Indians. And I think for me that really falls into kind of a I mean well and didn't mean to place. Um, so that's, that to me is I think what's most dangerous is not really grappling with the lived history but this idea of Indianness. My name is Eliza Irizarry. I'm representing here Miami Theater Center. I'm original from Venezuela. Um, red face for me is a racist uh, word and phrase. Um, at least we hear listening to many nations, as you name them, uh, in one salon. In Venezuela, our tribes live in the borders. You have, to, if you want to meet a tribe or you want to know about, you have to go to the south of uh, Venezuela or to the borders of Delta Macuro to the Atlantic or to the Colombian border to meet the Wayus or meet other. Or, so they live in the border of the country. Here, at least, your states have the nations inside. We don't. So I'm here also to learn and to share our experience. My name is Mallory Pierce. I'm the an enrolled member of Cherokee Nation. I'm also the director of marketing at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. We're going to be producing this season. Uh, Red Face is very complicated for me. It feels like theft and replacement and serves to impose a white construct of culture that, um. Hi, my name is Adam Omi okay? I'm from Round and I'm live streaming this session. <laughs> um, <laughs> you guys can see me. <laughs> but the folks at home can't. Um, <laughs> Um, so we actually did a series a while ago um, called Instead of Red Face on HowlRound. And um, one of the reasons why I specifically said like, I want to live stream this session is because I feel like Red Face along with Black Face and Yellow Face are, um, are not only um, appropriation, forms of appropriation, but also damaging and hurtful. And I'm just really interested to be a fly on the wall and hear this conversation. Uh, we have Ella and Julia. Oh, we're, we're moderating. I'll, oh, okay. You'll hear more from us. Okay, <laughs> my, name is, uh, my name is Ella. Uh, what was the assignment? Oh. Somebody, I, I, I mean, I what think I have the hang of it. And what red face who who you? are who you we are. and what does that mean? Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Ella. I'm the Senior Program Officer for Arts and Cultural Heritage at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And so uh, the cultural heritage part, well, the arts and culture, you get the idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very interested in art and cultural heritage. Um, uh, but on the uh, more uh, sort of where the personal and professional meet for me is that uh, when I was very young and I learned about um, Native Americans in school, which were not, uh, is not called Native American um, or indigenous peoples or anything like that, as you know, um, although I don't know what the kids are learning now actually, but um, it all sounded wrong to me from the get-go, actually, it was taught monstrously uh, poorly, and um, and for whatever reason, I just became curious. And uh, when I was um, I was born and raised in New York City, I moved to New Mexico, and uh, there, as an outsider, um, I learned a, a great deal. And I became interested in the art and, and, and all of the, the entire cultural um, idea of that particular part of the United States. And uh, it was a great learning experience for me. And like being in another country where one is the other, to have the experience of being the other when I was with um, people uh, who were Native Americans was uh, 
extraordinarily valuable as it was in other places in the world because at that time it was really like going to another country. I mean, it was, you know. Um, and um, um, so I am very interested in um, sort of continuing, really, um, my appreciation for and my understanding of. And it's, um, while I was at UC Berkeley, um, I had the privilege of going to Kroger Hall, um, and some of you may know the story of Ishii, um, who was kept in Kroger Hall, the last of his people. And this and other stories, but Ishii in particular, was one of the saddest stories I ever heard. And I've never gotten over it. I will never get over it. No one should get over it. And, um, and I think those were the kinds of experiences that engaged me in uh, my interest in this particular uh, culture and cultures within uh, that culture. And um, so thank you. My name is Tom Pruitt. I'm artistic director of WSC Avant Bar. We're a classically based theater company uh, based in Arlington, Virginia. And about a year ago, we were approached by the Jamestown, Yorktown uh, Foundation uh, to uh, submit a proposal for some sort of site-specific production, uh, which sounded very exciting. Uh, and um, we did a site visit and toured all that stuff. The, the production was specifically around the fact that, as, as probably most of you know, the Sea Venture was a resupply ship that was headed towards Jamestown uh, and, and had a shipwreck, ran into a storm and shipwrecked. And that became the inspiration for Shakespeare's The Tempest. And so, um, and then the supply ships, they were rebuilt and then eventually made it to Jamestown. So we were asked to do some sort of site-specific theater production that had something to do with Shakespeare's The Tempest. It became abundantly clear uh, to me when we were there uh, that, uh, that we, need, we, we, we could not do such a production uh, without engaging with uh, the Native American tribes and, and so forth that uh, you know, were part of that whole story uh, and uh, who still live there and are very much part of the exhibits and the, the curating of the, uh, of the exhibits at, <coughs> at the foundation. So in any case, um, uh, I'm here to learn and to explore ideas. Uh, and for Redface, uh, it's a very, uh, clearly to me, it's, it's a very racist term. I'm particularly interested in the conversation about cultural appropriation and casting in terms of uh, theater production in general. So. I'm Barry Newport. I'm producing artistic director of Penobscot Theater Company. Um, a year ago, I um, sat in a similar forum and uh, was trying to figure out how to build a bridge between uh, this theater company that has long ago appropriated the name of the people who now live 11 miles up the road, but for whatever reason, Penobscot Theater Company and the Penobscot Nation had never worked together, right, Marsha? Unbelievable, unbelievable. Um, and when I came for my interview for this job, I asked, what does Penobscot refer to? What does it mean? And nobody on the board or staff could tell me, and it really, really bugged me. <laughs> and I made it uh, one of my, I put it on my like list of like top three things that I wanted to accomplish um, in my tenure at Penobscot Theatre Company, but I wasn't sure how. And it wasn't until Acadia National Park reached out um, well over a year ago now, like 18 months ago, asking if, <coughs> if this theatre company would do something for the National Park Centennial in the park. And I said, have you reached out to the Penobscot Nation yet? And they said they hadn't. And so I thought, okay, now's the time. And, um, and I reached out to Larissa because I really was unsure of how to, how to build the bridge. And, um, and I'm just so happy to report that, you know, we really spent the last year um, learning uh, some sort of common vocabulary and um, beginning a practice of uh, trust and, um, and we've been working um, every month and now every week um, with Penobscot artists. And I don't even know if these people would call themselves, would have called themselves artists a year ago, but they do now. Um, we've been able to pay everybody. 
And um, good for you. And thank you. And in, um, in uh, eight weeks, in eight weeks, we will be performing something called Transformer Tales, which are traditional Penobscot creation stories with 40 kids, elders, um, once um, in Acadia National Park at the Blackwoods Amphitheater. We've also partnered with the Abbey Museum on this project. Um, once on Indian Island, um, which is where the Penobscot Nation is now based. And, uh, and twice at um, the Bangor Opera House, which is our home. So it really was based a lot in me sitting in a similar circle last year, and I really have to thank you for, for the guidance you helped me. Um, and, and it's continued work. I mean, it's not a one-off. We will also um, be working to have a drama club in uh, the Indian Island School for the first time, and we've been spending um, portions of every month in the school giving or helping to give voice. Um, some of these young people uh, just haven't had an opportunity to, uh, to create their own, to create their own stories. Um, uh, Red Face to me, I honestly have never even said those words together. The first thing that comes to mind is a, car is a cartoon, a two-dimensional cartoon. Thank you all. There's a part of me that's very Western trained. I'm actually an attorney. Um, and so I have to go and actually look up the definition of red face to try and find a definition of red face. That's the first thing, is to try and find a definition of red face. Um, most of them are putting, most of the definitions are kind of putting it in the context of black face, which is uh, entirely appropriate. Um, but what I found was red face refers to the creation and propagation of racist American Indian stereotypes and caricatures. It also describes the systematic bias against hiring real Native Americans to play Native American roles shown by white producers, directors, and others who control the depiction of Native Americans in popular culture through casting decisions, um, which is in part why we're here. We are at a theater conference. Um, in my own life, I, you know, we have had, I have instances of what you would call red face um, throughout my life, and I think many of us here have experienced that personally. Um, in my case, um, I worked at a black theater company. And the reason I worked at a black theater company was because there was no native theater company. And if I had said to someone, oh, I want to start a native theater company, the first words out of their mouth would have been, oh, how much Indian are you? Mm -hmm. right? <coughs> Whereas I could go to a black theater company and say, oh, I'm part black, and they would say, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> it was never going to be a question. Um, and so that is, um, that is how it plays out in part in our everyday lives. Um, and so when we were talking about this, we really don't want this to be a gripe session about red face. Um, it's very clear, uh, all, everything that you have said in this room, yes, mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. It is also a lazy way of addressing uh, the, perpetuating red face is a lazy way of addressing the persistent um, discrimination, racism against peoples in this country. Um, it is when people say, oh, I can't find an Indian. I went out on the street, and she wants to know this was coming. I went out from the street, not the street, and I didn't see any. <laughs> <laughs> or you don't look like an Indian. Or it, it's just going to be too hard. I just need to do this. Right? So. That's really what, uh, how it plays out within the theater world. So, and I'm gonna turn this over to Larissa, and she gets to um, I, one of the things that has been a response to that has been the instead of red face. And, um, and thank you to HowlRound for the opportunity that, I mean, it's, if you haven't read these series of writings, they are amazing, and they are, they are very clear, and they are inspiring in so many ways. Um, and many of those people are in this room here today, so I would encourage you to go there. <laughs> go there and, and read 
Um, and at, just to inform yourself, and also just to be thrilled by how smart and how vibrant and how dedicated our community is. So. Okay, thank you, Kita. So um, I, we're almost done talking, and then it's a, I promise. Um, us guys. Um, so uh, just for a quick um, honoring of the hashtag, so there's a hashtag instead of red face that, um, that uh, is out in the world. Um, unfortunately, Mary Catherine Nagel who started this, um, could not be here even though she lives in DC. She was in Oklahoma doing the work. She's also, she's a playwright. Her name's on here a few times already. Um, and she's a playwright, but she's also um, an attorney who works for indigenous issues in law. So she's out doing the work. Um, but she, so I just had a chance to speak with her in LA. It was, so to get kind of the background of this for you all, um, she was really interested and she, she'd been, we've been, a lot of us have been speaking for a while about having sort of a Kilroy's ish, ish, I can't say the word, but a Kilroy's like, shall we say, list of indigenous playwrights because that's, you know, we hear again, you know, can't find one. Um, and so, um, can actually wipe out like half of the indigenous theater artists in America in this room. Anyway, um, I was just looking around like, wow, I just have to like erase this. It'd just be Mary Catherine Nagel left. Um, so, uh, um, so she she was like, I really want to create this, but um, she was having a really hard time finding. She couldn't find resources for her website building. She couldn't get anyone to. She didn't know how. I didn't know how. We couldn't get people to donate time or money or whatever we needed to um, start something like this. And she just was having a really hard time. She worked at it for probably about a year. She was, I think, mm -hmm. working on this, right? And um, just couldn't get the um, logistical support she needed. So when um, HowlRound, hi everybody, uh, asked her to curate this, um, these uh, essays um, about the American Indian, indigenous theatrical experience in this area this um, geographic area, uh, she said, aha, hashtags. Um, so she started the hashtag instead of red face and um, added that to all of the, the series and then has, that has continued to grow and live in the world. So what that means is without any of us having to do any structural work and website things we don't know how to do, um, you can both on you know Twitter and on Facebook, you can look up in the hashtag instead of red face and find news on all the indigenous theater that's going on in this country, on indigenous performers and where they're working on indigenous writers, on all the different programs that are happening. So um, I'm terrible, I never hashtag my stuff, but fortunately I have smart actors that do. So um, you know, some, <laughs> some of us are terrible about this. But so that's where the idea came from and that's all Mary Catherine Nagel that came up with this. And um, she's, uh, and it's been, she's done a lovely, she's given us a lovely gift, all of us, a wonderful gift that we now can't say, I can't find one, I don't know what to do, I don't know where to go. All these different artists are hashtagging their work and hashtagging work they're seeing and hashtagging work that they're um, developing and doing that there. So you can go there and it's a start. It's of course not everything, but it's a start with a lot of writers, a lot of directors, and a lot of actors, they're all indigenous. And um, so know that, that's there for you. And that's um, why we wanted to do this. What was really exciting to me about um, this session, um, I've been a co-facilitator of these for like you know, three, four years now, um, is that we really wanted to be a celebration of the things that happened in the past year since Mary Catherine did that hashtag, since um, we've been having these sessions. That was one of the things I was about to write on my list was Penobscot. Um, and, and the growth that we're seeing just by having these sessions and by being in these rooms together and connecting with each other, um, there's been so much that's going on. I mean, so I'm just starting, as I told you, because I you know, got off the plane and ran in the room. Um, I just started writing things. I will have all my ERs and RES wrong. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so just get over it. Um, except the, the, you know, the uh, spirit of the list. Um, so I'm starting a list. We're gonna set it somewhere. I could add to this. What's fantastic is I could keep adding to this for at least another page and a half of in theater companies and organizations and um, that are doing indigenous work, working with indigenous actors, writers, directors, um, and are, are supporting indigenous works through their funding. So um, I could keep going just from the people I know for a good another page and a half here. Several of you companies are in the room that I've written down because they're all working with me and that seems very self-serving. Um, but I, you know, if you want to mention yourselves, go for it um, and I, I celebrate you. Um, and, and so I just want to throw that out there about how that is and how you can help find 
actors, find writers, find directors, find indigenous projects that are happening all over the um, Turtle Island right now. Um, I have to, I didn't say, and I apologize to my elders, I did not say I'm from the Sakanju Lakota Nation. I was again thrown from running off the plane. So um, I'm from the Sakanju Lakota Nation in South Dakota. Um, that's where my people are, that's where I grew up. Um, that's what's still home, even though I live in California now. And um, I just had to say that for my elders, apologies. Um, so now we're gonna break out and do some talking and brainstorming and discussions because we want to leave with positive things. Do you want to talk about this? So we really do want to come up with things that can be accomplished within the next year. And this is why I'm so <coughs> excited about what have, you can see what can happen in a year. Penobscot mm -hmm. is an amazing story. Um, and there are, um, we thought we might break this into um, indigenous and non-indigenous, so indigenous and allies. Um, if it means that you come up with more <coughs> questions, that's good too, because that gives us a place to start from in the report back to start thinking about how do we build this. Um, it, I'm excited to see Cole here because we started a conversation what, about a year ago um, about an indigenous performance network, somewhat modeled a little bit after theirs. Um, and so that's what, so these ideas will also help feed into how may we model some of that um, and maybe work across that political border, which is not a real border for us. Um, and so um, it is 3.59 until 4.30. So um, I think 15 minutes of just conversation in Two groups, three groups, how was like three. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, if if we could do it as indigenous and as allies, um, that would be great because I think there are different action steps we all need to take. Um, and I think we do want to make it concrete, something we can do together or individually in a year. Okay. So let's do um, and you don't have to indigenous folks, you can choose to go elsewhere. Um, but we want to offer that space. So let's say indigenous folks, if you'd like to speak here and talk about action steps we as indigenous people can take within the theater field in the next year so that we can report back success in Portland as Barry just did. Bangor. Bang Bangor. Oh, sorry. Gosh, my brain. Sorry. Anyway. Yes, I'm Bangor. Um, and then um, if we could have maybe all our allies kind of self-split yourself into two groups um, because there's just a lot of you. Yay. Um, and we can uh, come up with like two action steps that your organizations or yourselves in your organizations can do in the next year to um, help us eliminate red face and promote instead of red face and, and what you can do to make that a, a larger movement by next year in Portland when we all reconvene. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm sorry, I have hearing issues and sorry. I don't know. I don't think either one of you introduced yourselves Oh, I did in the beginning. Sorry, yes. Larissa Fast Horse is my name, and I'm a playwright from, um, and that's why I'm here. Okay. My name is Keita Sullivan. I'm the manager of the National Theater Project at New England Foundation for the Arts. Um, so I uh, support theater nationally. I am thrilled that last year we actually supported our first indigenous project, um, and that over the last few years we have actually seen an increase. We have others who have made it to the finalist. Um, so I'm like, this makes my heart sing. Um, I don't get to vote on who gets a grant. But I have my favorites. Um, but I love working with artists, and I especially love it when indigenous artists come through, um, through our program. So, so, yes. Should we talk about what we actually are doing, or should this be focused on brainstorming? Brainstorming things to be done, right. to report out as a group. Yeah. Though. Right. And so maybe think someone is doing, that the group wants to say, we want to all do that. And we also, we're going to leave this here um, so that if, as you are thinking of other positive things that have been happening, add it on here. I mean, you know, perhaps that obviously needs to be here, um, but I think there are other things that are going on. I think the recreation of a performance, I was gonna say, it's minor right now. Correct. A performance minor at IAIA is a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. It's like AIA. Mm -hmm. 
Claire? Claire? 15 minutes to ish yeah. to talk. So, so but. You just said a Maybe this
And we don't, we don't need to have the other It's called assimilation, and it's about the majority of the that's, that's, that's what the track oh, last year, uh, uh, he, he was a doctor in jazz field class, and he's quite a lot of He's a workshops, and so he's a blood pressure theater. This is Alaska. Don't I probably budgetary. Yeah, that would be a for for joint programming series. And I'm happy to share with you the work on our campus because we're also a travel company. I work with a wilderness school and we do a production of wild theater. So it's two weeks of making theater entirely outdoors in the woods. And unless it's lightning, it's so, so we make sure to be very safe and careful on that level. Um, and the kids have a free range of forests. We create things from natural objects and everything. We can show them how to make puppets and then also create things from like called forest forests or pond forests <laughs> based on the, the terrain that we're in. So, what we're interested, what I'm interested in doing is um, integrating some elders from our local community into the project because I really love this concept of multi generational theater and dialogue and also um, just honoring the land that we are on and really paying respect to the history of this land because this is New England and the rocks are so old and they just go back so, so yeah. I might just see the sort of thing about the giant mountain in my time, you know, and just to think that it can somehow connect more with as far back as we possibly can with that land. That would be fantastic. So we do have some elders in our community that we're going to invite and possibly also some other indigenous voices from across the I was going to say that one thing that the greater region is sort of not involved with that, but it's just a leader there. I'm a leader of this organization, and I'm a director, and so I talk a lot, and I'm very shocked about the professor gathers that. But on the other hand, in order to get stuff done, I talk a lot. I'm Margot Lucas, and maybe from the University of Maine. You know, so it seems like to me that there's like a couple of thousands there, wanting to work out it and making the work happen, whether there's funding or not. So how it's come to the best part. Uh, uh, and I hope from now because it connects up that's in the eye of us so that we know who is our You know, it's really interesting. I'm sitting here thinking about Broadway. Ignorance. And okay, it's let's create a, a play by workshop and invite a bunch of indigenous people. I create the workshops and I research is it. That's not how it works. So, you know, we're in the process of learning. I don't really have We're still anything to say that I can do anything on the people of Gander are indigenous to the mouth. The villain is that they, they seriously are in the involved in that project, so that's the only thing I'll be doing in the conversation. Organization is connected to a local need to sales goes after celebration and we're bringing people they go after every other one of us try to and I don't know, you know, I 
in the Brazilian just, Amazon like, got very yeah, close and, to and the world. Well, like, yeah. It was a and, uh, pretty clear uh, we are kind of period of the very passionate. So Larry is yeah. yeah. so yeah. yeah. so yeah. yeah. like, yeah. so yeah. it's called. It's called. So it's like a very interesting look like we are. We stand in the world. We seem to go down that slope. So it's just uh, I've, I've been, been very careful in that is saying to the I'm saying to yeah, yeah, so I want to make sure so that the playwrights like Larissa do. You know, to what, you know, we have to be uh, very careful with anyway, how we're writing them and how we're writing them. If you've ever seen anything, and how they're writing them, that would be the case. The 1890-something Chicago World Fair was a big thing. Yeah, you know, and I think that, you know, if you want to expand it to not for profit in New York, uh, or it's a very I don't know, difficult I'd have to investigate we have to meet the regional road to Arizona, to Mexico. It's a very we, difficult path. We, we are, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and one of the cool. things I know is when they say we would have done this, right. Right. don't right. come right. to us yeah. to help us. But I'm not even talking about testing, I'm talking about materials, I'm talking about content. Well, what you're saying is in the area. So if you have any things to share, there are. How to work and not all of us are such a clear and my answer would be like a layer comes in 50 years. So we don't do something to the rainforest, so there's a clear mandate. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so sort of not to repeat the movie on the car, it was so beautiful and so awful. Other institutions <laughs> are thinking of water, but it's much got to be cool. And then what are the actual issues beyond, beyond the obvious issues? We should be more engaged. What's the actual issue? What's the actual issue? And we can still work around that. We want to push this work and then to come up with a couple of things on the lot of rights. And then I'll always ask myself, no, I mean, I don't know. I mean, my sisters in 2012, and Baron Zuzenbag was an African American actor, and Irina was a little bit. I mean, I would love to have more space, more room available to somehow bring in and really need Tell them the story of who I am. And then we don't really have, they don't have the opportunity to tell their story and where it doesn't exist. So I think, you know, sometimes people don't listen to you for certain reasons. But, you know, as an ally, what is it that I can do? I can stand up and advocate for them. Have their voice heard and have their presence heard. Right. 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 And, uh, you know, we were also well, noted, like, yeah. you know, how could they be siblings from different parents? You know, yeah, also there's um, maybe having an individual who is, like you said, they are a deaf and and that would be amazing. But then, you know, I mean, we haven't produced that, but we come to a show like this race, which is about race. And how did you pass that without being Do I have to pass Arab movies or do I have to pass for the main I mean, I'm not, can I put a white man playing that character and then the, the play doesn't work? But I do think it's 
very, very different is this question of um, because the, the white cultural like appropriation. So the, it doesn't go both ways. You know, it's like to to put you know to have the um, color conscious casting of saying like these roles can and should be opened up to all sorts of actors from different backgrounds. It's such a powerful and different thing. She's saying like right in our position, white on top of numbers will now be no especially in Miami. It was really important for me that it be bilingual, so I had Lakota, and English. And I wonder how you actually, the question, and in a way you're bilingual, I grew up bilingual. You have to deal with that. All right, everybody, in the interest of time, respecting time, let's all wrap up and get back into our circle, please. Let's all get back into our large circle, with everybody. Thank you. The original language. I just have another group to go to a more that was such a surprise, like when we saw it. I understand the situation. I understand the situation. I understand the situation. So which group would like to start? Volunteer group would like to start. Someone brave, someone willing. I feel it. <laughs> the indigenous folks will start. Yay! Go on, indigenous But um, some of the things that we really talked about a lot were about toolboxes. And we are a small community, um, and how do we amplify our voices and empower our allies? Um, also, uh, something that really stuck out, struck out too, or stuck out too, is um, uh, asking our allies to tell uh, the story of their previous engagement with Native artists, and how do they want to engage with our communities? So putting the onus on our allies to identify how it is that they want to work with Native communities so that we can better um, identify who's engaging with us in what feels like a, a respectful and uh, meaningful way. Um, and uh, you know, just uh, also uh, Rihanna brought up, up uh, this idea of um, how do we, as Native artists who are coming into a community, as a visiting artist, how do we build relationships with the local Native community that's already there, as opposed to being brought in as a token? We don't know what the relationship is that a local company has with the surrounding community, and how do we build instead of be part of a problem? Um, and then uh, something that Ty brought up that I think we all feel very strongly about uh, is that when larger theaters come to the Native community, and in particular come to Native Voices of Theatry as one of the premier uh, databases of Native playwrights in America, um, how uh, can we get money and resources coming from the more well-to-do and more uh, uh, resource-rich companies into our communities so that we are not constantly being asked to uh, provide our skills and our contacts for free. Yeah. All right, we're going to talk about quick. We talked about um, um, protocol. Yes. Protocol. Uh, a really simple thing, uh, which some companies do, uh, Randy does this at every performance, is honoring every single theater company in America should start off the night by uh, honoring the original inhabitants of the land on which their theater is located. And Randy has some language that he'll probably share with you. 
Yeah, nicely. Sure. <laughs> now or later? Yeah. Later, you put it in the toolbox. All right, how about, what was, how about this group that was sitting over here, since I'm over here with you guys? Um, in solidarity. The, this ally group, um, we talked about um, the um, Daniel uh, offered us a wonderful thing to think about, which is um, in engaging with native um, tribes, um, how to think about uh, conversations that you are co-conceiving and co-creating a partnership, so that there's not a, a, a landscape in which you're saying like, um, "Hey guys, like." Um, here's what I'm going to do for you. Um, so, so who's at the table and how does, how does that uh, work? Um, and thinking about the, uh, expanding a leadership so that, so that it isn't just a question of like how do we, uh, uh, white folks, um, how, do we, you know, how do we find Native actors, but rather like who, again, who's at the table as part of the leadership team of that project or um, uh, who, or organization who can who can speak to that who can who can really um, be part of that um, and then there's also um, uh, I mentioned uh, Haskell Indian University which is near us at Kansas City Repertory Theater we hope to collaborate with and um, ATHE is uh, uh, an organization that the, the Association for Theater and Higher Education right. which is the yearly conference for college theater educators and it has focus groups by discipline but there's no Native American or Indigenous uh, performance focus group and I think that really um, since there is such strong leadership now from uh, within contemporary Native performing arts that proposing to AFA to now have a focus group that focuses in this area um, will disseminate more information, get more people interested and also ability to change and introduce protocols that aren't being used currently. So this corner over here, I'd like to report some things. So we we discussed um, the about we talked about reading lists and um, at, like within the university setting and school setting, having having integration of some in, um, indigenous texts like assimilation was brought up as a play um, to be read with, to, with univer read by university students and then we were trying to figure out well then from there the issue of voice then comes in, like how do we also then incorporate the local community um, and indigenous voices um, who are present in the, in the community and neighboring nations and that kind of thing. And, um, and trying to figure that out um, on, by just making, making bridges and making connections and, um, and integrating especially the, the elders' voices and everything, I love that idea of you know, we what you said earlier, Larissa, about we have the honor to listen to the elders. I think that's, that's beautiful. Um, and also, also making connections with with um, other communities, including the deaf community, and how the deaf community could maybe somehow come together with the indigenous uh, ally, allies as well. Last corner over here. <laughs> uh, you know, we talked about two specific projects for most of the time, about the strategies that inform how the projects came together. One's an international project, um, and the other is a regional project, and we talked about ideas of how to build advisory councils, coalitions, uh, more community connections so that the leaders of the project don't feel this overwhelming sense of burden or uh, fear, I think, of making mistakes. So how could groups form a, a council? And we talked about there are some nice examples within the Lord Theater system of advisory councils that bring voices that might not necessarily be there. We also talked about intention. What is the intention of the project for everybody involved? And we talked about it in relation to what you brought up, um, environmental issues where, you know, uh, where, where it, it's a situation that will affect everybody, like Miami uh, currently and the nature in the Amazon and, uh, or water rights in the Western states uh, where, uh, and also we talked about patience. I mean, uh, developing relationships with people over time. 
and continuously. Um, our friend Kita here is going crazy on our list. Um, I'm going to be putting them up. I'd love to have, before you go, if you have time to add some things, I'm going to um, hashtag, uh, instead of red face, this list, um, so you can all find it. Uh, also, if any of you want to continue to be um, on kind of email, kind of make a little group here um, of allies and people we can kind of stay in touch. We have this list over here. Um, I would say what's really interesting listening to you all, um, this is the first time we've done this, where we let you all just talk by yourselves, <laughs> which is great, um, because, because you're so advanced and you can do that. Um, <laughs> yay. Uh, what, what's really interesting is um, hearing, hey, just in like the few years I've been, in, I'm, on, I'm on the board at TCG, so I'm really TCG involved, but in the few years of being involved in the indigenous work at TCG, it's amazing how um, I'm already seeing an evolution, right, of how we're looking, how we're th seeing things, how we're discussing them, the words we're using, um, the thoughtfulness, and also the, um, the variety of viewpoints, which is fantastic, because that's what we are. We're over 500 different individual nations living here in one um, overarching um, government that is a, a conquering government. Um, it's fascinating to me, I've said this before, but you know, like, we look at Africa or Europe, we get the concept. Completely different languages, different cultures, and for some reason we just don't get it here. And so even within our group, you know, there's a lot of things we don't agree on, and, and you will find that um, with indigenous people you deal with, because we're not monoliths. Um, and, and so I love that we're talking about a lot of variety of things and varieties of ways of looking at things, because that's what it takes to work with any foreign, foreign nation, right? And, and that's what you're dealing with, is, is a foreign nation. And it's going to take time, and it's going to take a variety of viewpoints, a variety of what entry points, and you cannot do all of it. So do something though, right? Because that's my, my biggest issue as a, a Native um, American artist working in American theater, is people are so afraid of screwing up, so afraid of not being able to do it all, so afraid of not doing it right, that they do nothing. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had my place outright rejected on that, literally laid it out, like we're afraid we're gonna screw it up, so we're just not gonna do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and that's, that's not getting any of us anywhere, yeah. So um, I appreciate you guys being brave and discussing, and, and I'd love to stay in touch and keep adding things and let my friend Kita close us out. So I want to say to Brittany, to all of you for coming, thank you. Um, it is, I think, the first time we've sort of started to try and pull together some action steps, um, and we will hashtag these, we'll get them out. Um, and hopefully we will see you all next year to talk about progress, um, because I really think it is possible. There has been such an evolution. Um, the fact that, you know, I, I, I'm gonna go back to San Diego. Um, the fact that there were so many of us there in San Diego and the, the wide variety of us who were there from so many nations, um, and the look on people's faces when they got to see us all stand together in that room. From that moment when there was a realization, I think, on their part that we are, we are here, we're not invisible, um, and I think that um, there's, there's just been so much, it, it fills my heart so much to have um, all of you in the room as allies, as uh, folks who are moving forward with us, um, one of the things we did discuss is that for our allies, it's very important to have you speak and stand with us, not for us, but with us. And so I, uh, I want to say to Ruby, thank you for being here. Okay, thank you. And that's our time. Yeah.